Got a lot of spaces there. Okay. Well, um, we should be on air. Uh, Good day, everybody. Uh, I'll give everybody a minute or two to uh, get connected, and we'll start in a couple of minutes. Where we measure the lag. Oh, somebody's got a. Well, um, we should be on air. Okay, well, I'm seeing it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Can we have everybody uh, say hello? Why can Jason not get in? Is it because we're too late? Hello. We should be on air. G'day, everybody. Uh, I'll give everybody a minute or two to. No, yeah, Tim, I can tell you're getting in. Yes. Uh -huh. <coughs> Dave, the d can't hear you at all. Uh, yes, now? Yes, you can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's yep. not very loud. Jason. I think Tan, uh, Tim, you might need to turn down your sound or put on some headphones. Well, you can just hit mute while you're not speaking, perhaps. Or that. Or not watch the video in the background because <laughs> you're in the video. Uh, Okay. One problem with using this account is that my name is Tim Mitting on the video, which is odd. I'll be Tim Mitting. So, uh, Jason, we're just waiting for Jason to get in, and he, Jason, I've sent you a URL. He said he's having some trouble actually getting the Google plugin going, which uh. does, sounds a bit foreboding. Okay. Well, <clears throat> he's sometime later, so I suggest we start and he can get in when he gets in. He should have all the URLs. So, uh, well, hello, everyone. Um, soft start to the meeting. Uh, we're all here. Uh, lots of people to talk, uh, presenting a bunch of different things. Um, obviously, the main thing on the agenda is imminent 2.6 release, uh, a few weeks away, three weeks away. Um, and of course, this is the uh, end of the cycle where all of the big things have landed or sometimes not landed. Um, so we can talk about that. Um, we also have uh, a number of things still to be fixed, um, still being polished, sometimes uh, in a slight panic. Um, but uh, we should be on pretty much on track, I think. Everyone agrees uh, for a release in three weeks, so uh, all pretty good. So we've got an agenda. Uh, if you look on the web page, uh, you can see the things coming up. Um, we may have time at the end to uh, talk about anything else you want to cover uh, while we've got people here. And um, so, uh, so thanks. So we'll get started. So, well. Uh, Starting off with the, the new releases, I guess uh, you can look at the link of the new releases. I might share a screen. That'd be probably a good idea to do that. <clears throat> so hopefully that's a good size. Um, Let's put the agenda here, um, and uh, 
the new features. Now, the release notes are still, this is a bit of an awkward time, the release notes are only still being uh, put together, um, so they're a bit rough right now. Um, for the purposes of this meeting, I guess the main things to be looking for are down towards the bottom where it has API changes for developers. Um, some of those things are what are going to be covered by other people today, but uh, some not. So if you want to talk about any of those, uh, now's a good time during this meeting to do that. Um, but other than that, there is an awful lot of uh, new features. I would say mostly smaller new features. Now, the, there was two really big things that we were working on that did not make it into 2.6. So a good test of our new time-based releases. Um, we did promise that if things weren't ready, they won't get in. And there are two big things that HQ is developing ourselves uh, which have not got in. So the first one is uh, logging. The new logging uh, infrastructure is not fully finished. Um, what happened in the meantime was uh, the, the precursor to that was an improvement to the whole event infrastructure. And um, that's partially in, but uh, the full logging stuff will not really be there until 2.7. Um, Peter will talk about that the, uh, the events later on. The uh, other big feature that didn't land is outcomes. And this was the new uh, feature that Moodle Rooms had primarily developed. They had the spec up at the beginning of the year or even earlier uh, for that development. They, they did a lot of coding on it. Uh, it came to the front end team in Moodle HQ. Um, went through lots and lots and lots of reviews, but in the end, they, we ran out of time, and I, there's still lots still to do, um, and so that's been pushed back. That'll be the first major project that Frontend tackles in the 2.7 cycle. Um, there will be a, um, a whole group um, team meeting, so the whole Frontend team, maybe some of the back-end team, um, and the Moodle Rooms guys who wrote the original code. Um, we're going to sit down together and really um, plan that through. The good thing about that is that outcomes will be much more um, fully completed for 2.7. Um, it was pretty sort of um, it, it was pretty complete, but it was uh, I guess missing some things that were in the spec. It was like a stage two. So hopefully that will get um, into the uh, uh, They'll, they'll be really good when it gets to, to the end of the 2.7 cycle. And outcomes is all about uh, every grading event having a link to some outcomes which can roll up eventually into a notion of competencies and you can say that a particular person knows a particular thing. Uh, very huge request, so that that's uh, we want to do it right, I think, uh, when it hits core. Uh, Mark mentioned Atto. Uh, for some, there is this uh, alternate editor um, that um, uh, Damien Weiss had uh, developed, which is a pretty cool editor. Um, it was in core up until today, um, but I've made the difficult decision to remove it um, just because the introduction of a second HTML editor brings a bunch of other problems with it, um, probably more than it solves at the moment. Um, so to avoid confusion, that's removed. But it will be in the plugins directory, and people can still use that editor if they want. And again, in 2.7, we're going to really look at the whole issue of editors and replace TinyMC3 completely uh, and with a better alternative. Um, and what that is, I can't, we don't know yet. Uh, maybe Atto, maybe something based on TinyMC4, maybe something else. We'll have to look at the whole thing. Um, uh, and it will be uh, good, I hope. So that's kind of the major developments. Um, the, uh, the many, many smaller things are listed here. Now, there's also a new features page, which is also pretty new and not optimized yet. Um, it's got a mix of um, the features that are probably most exciting for uh, users. Um, and uh, you can see some of them here. Uh, there are some things not on here yet, and I suspect some reordering of this page is going to occur before the end. Um, but you can certainly get a sense of what's made it uh, into 2.6.
If you're interested. Uh, any uh, any questions you have? Far away in the chat now. Uh, we can, you know, if you want to talk about anything in more depth there. But um, uh, I wasn't intending to go through all the all the features here in this meeting, but <clears throat> um, but we can discuss more developery things towards the end. I'm not seeing many comments in the chat here. Okay, I guess there's some lag, but let's ask questions later on. I'd just like to move on to uh, next on the list, which is uh, Helen, uh, just to talk about the QA that started yesterday. So, Helen, you want to take over? Hi there. Uh, let me share my screen if I can find it. Uh, you see my screen now? I can see it fine, Helen. I think it's yeah, that's working cool. well. Okay, so if you haven't heard, we just started our Moodle 2.6 QA cycle. Um, this is the QA testing dashboard showing we've already up to 58 tests passed and uh, seven bugs found so far. If you'd like to get involved, We've got a QA testing guide here. Uh, it's really easy to help out, and if you even run just one test, then you get mentioned in the credits, and uh, maybe we'll organize some badges for QA testers. You never know. Uh, in the 2.6 QA cycle, we've currently got uh, 462 tests. If you're interested in testing, um, one of the latest features, then you have to scroll to the bottom. All the new stuff is down here at the bottom. Um, although we're working towards more automated testing, there are some things which can't be tested automatically. So if you've developed a new feature or improvement that can't be tested automatically, then you should make sure that your issue is labeled QA test required uh, then Mary and I go through all these issues and we write new QA tests. We'll probably even write new tests to be added to this cycle. And uh, after writing a test, then in the tracker issue, we add a little comment. Uh, this one got a comment, yep. Yeah. Uh, here's where Mary added that uh, it's um, so that you and anyone watching the the issue can then check out the test so that it covers it nicely. Um, just to mention uh, for QA tests and also uh, for documentation, it's really handy uh, like this this new feature for assignment here. Uh, if you as a developer can write some documentation in the dev docs to help us out. So uh, Dan wrote some nice uh, documentation there and then we can um, transfer bits to the to the user docs and it helps us write the QA test. Uh, anyone, any questions or comments about uh, QA testing? No? There's a one minute lag. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a big lag, unfortunately. Um, I can't wait for Hangouts to actually have some chat included in the stream, but uh, unfortunately we're stuck with this at the moment. You should have one beer after each. Speech waiting for the <laughs> questions. <laughs> Only you can take a beer in a minute. Wow. Um, I see that Eric is asking uh, whether the user docs have been split. Yes, and uh, yeah, everyone's answering. Um, uh, David, crea David Mudrak created them uh, yesterday. So you're welcome if you if you like to just write docs, your user docs yourselves. Otherwise, Mary and I will be going through checking 
that everything's uh, documented in time for the release. Uh, I, do you hear me? Yes. I, I would add that uh, there is also a label called accept, acceptance stage required that I'm going through it. All the issues label with acceptance stage required and creating, creating new behalf tests for them. But ideally, the test will be included in, uh, in the new feature. So. I'm um, not quite sure I heard everything David was saying, but I think he was mentioning about adding the label acceptance test required for uh, automated testing. Is that what you were saying, Dave, uh, David? Uh, yes, Helen. I, uh, yes, that I, uh, the same you are, Mary, and you are doing with QA test required is what I'm doing with acceptance test required. I'm going through the list of new issues and the ones labeled as acceptance test required, creating a new MDL and adding a VHAT test for it. Uh -huh. And there's a good page in the docs, maybe someone come up with a link in the dev docs explaining uh, how you write the, the automated test. Yep, someone sh should post that in the chat. I'm, I'm looking for the... If you can turn up your volume, David, it would be good too, because you're still very quiet. So, you know. Thanks, oh, David. Okay. You posted the link. Uh, and, and worth mentioning that the, the, the tests will... I'm sorry, maybe I missed it, but the, the tests are... The QA test list will slowly reduce as the automated tests replace them, uh, we hope. Yes. All right. Uh, thanks, Hal. Is that Thank everything you. you were going to cover? Yep. OK, thanks. Uh, well, so uh, now, as we flow on from testing, um, when you're testing, you often need uh, lots of test data. And uh, so Marina's going to talk about uh, a couple of things that's been happening uh, in the past couple of uh, months related to generating test data. So over to you, Marina. Yeah, I think Tim wanted to go first, I believe. Yeah, thanks for being on late. No, is, is Tim... Tim. Tim Hunt. Oh, you want Tim? Uh, can you wait for Tim? You want to hop in? Right. We can... Uh, we'll jump to Tim. So. Tim is uh, want to talk about question behaviours, I think. Right. Yes. Hopefully this can be quite quick. And I have just hopefully shared a browser window. Um, if someone could let me know when that appears. Yes. Yeah, so yep. if you do quiz stuff, um, then you need to know. And, and if particularly if you have written a question behaviour plugin, um, you need to know about this. So um, what you're looking at is a classic how the quiz review page used to look. Uh, you've got a chunk of information at the top about the attempt. And what's new in this version, if I switch to a screen grab here, is that um, now the the question behavior can supply some extra summary information about the attempt that then gets displayed. Um, and in, uh, if you're interested in certainty-based marking as a user, then a teacher, then this is a good thing because it help, it's some extra useful feedback to your students. And if you're a developer who has created a question behavior, then you might want to take make use of this mechanism to add some interesting summary information to the quiz review page about your own behavior. So um, the bad news about, th this is a nice new feature, the bad news is it is a not backwards compatible change in question behaviors, so you'll need to look in question behavior upgrade.txt to fix your plugin if you have a question behavior plugin, but it doesn't take very long to fix a particular plugin, you just need to move a bit of code around. Um, that was all I wanted to say, really. I hope that's okay. Yeah, cool, thanks. 
Tim. Uh, it, out of interest, is anybody here uh, working on, uh, anybody in the list working on question types? I'm on the wrong page. I'm going to have to wait for a minute for that question. I should have typed it. Right, I'm afraid I've got a dash now. The, the very annoying to have another real world meeting at the same time as this one, but I'll watch the recording later. And obviously, if anyone has any questions, they should put it in the quiz forum as usual. Thanks, Tim. No worries, Tim. Thanks for coming along. Uh, cheers. All right, so to Marina, data generation. Hi. Um, I'm just going to post the link in dev chat uh, with the presentation because I have lots of links there and samples of code if anybody wants to use them anywhere. So um, uh, another thing I need to figure out is how to share my screen. It's the uh, green, the third icon down, the green one. Screen share. Second. Okay. On the left. Maybe second. Oh. Depends who you are. Yeah. One looks like a screen with an arrow in it. Does it? Does That's it work it. now? You got yep. It. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh, so first, first tool that is uh, new in two point six that I want to talk about is to upload course. It's not exactly development tool. It's an admin tool, but it's perfect for data generation for course generation. Uh, there is um, there was an original plugin uh, by Piers Harding and I think Peter as well. Peter as well because I saw his copyright there, but I didn't see him in discussion. And Fred um, uh, moved it to the core. And <clears throat> so the um, it works. This is <laughs> okay. Somebody's asking about my hair color. Okay, uh, so this is the um, interface how it looks. You just upload the CSV file uh, and and it also allows to fill all the missing field, um, fields with the default values. And you just click the button and it all creates the courses. And especially nice about it is that you can specify the um, uh, backup file and the course will be restored from backup file. And in my example, um, I have several courses with the same backup file and quite quickly I can generate lots of content on, on the site. Well, it's repeating content, but for development, it's OK. <laughs> um, I think it's extremely nice too, and it also allows to update the uh, courses. Um, one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't create the course categories, but I think we can work on it. Um, so another tool uh, that already existed for a long time is um, okay. It takes a while to restore the courses. I'm sorry. Uh, is upload user? You probably all know it. it just CSV file that, OK, it worked. Great. So I have two courses created. So now I go to users. Um, the same, oh, sorry, it's wrong file. The same um, way with the CSV file, I can upload users fill the missing fields, and users are created. Um, enroll flat file is also existed for a long time. It's a plugin that allows to, um, again, with a CSV file, enroll students into courses. Um, unfortunately, it requires that all users and courses have ID numbers. So I already um, included ID, ID numbers of courses and users in the, in the CSV files. Um, I'm not probably not going to show how it works, because it's not that interesting. 
So now going back to, uh, not back, forth, sorry, to the generate, data generator. Um, this has existed in model already, but um, now it's more like a one APA that is used in um, BHAT uh, tests, in PHP unit tests, and also can be used in scripts and tools. Um, class testing data generator um, has, as you see, the following methods. Using those methods, you can easily create courses, users, enroll them, create modules, um, um, assign roles, and so forth. Um, rep well, repositories are not really, they're more for testing, for PHP unit tests, because they, um, uh, you can't really put content in the repositories using generator. Uh, same with modules. Uh, create module function creates the, um, just a module shell. Um, only for some modules we have some functions that would put content to it, but mostly it's just, uh, it's just filling the add module form. But still, it's it's already a lot. Uh, it, using this tool, we can create lots of data and big courses. Um, the methods that are marked with the asterisk is um, actually um, methods that redirect to the particular plugin generator. So each block or repository or module plugin can implement its own generator inside, um, extending um, one of the abstract classes, testing block generator, testing module generator, or testing repository generator, and Im implement the fun function create instance inside that will create an instance of this particular plugin. So how this can be used? Um, first, Everybody knows that it is used everywhere in unit tests, and this is an example of um, how to create course category, course user, enroll user, uh, create block, create module. Uh, there are two ways of creating modules, if you can see from this example. I don't know if the font is big enough. Um, so the page module I, cre uh, I create by calling the function create module, but the forum module I create by um, first retrieving the instance of the forum generator and then calling create instance method insta inside forum generator. Uh, this can be useful for those modules that implemented some content generation as well. For example, forum has additional function there to put create discussions and uh, posts. Um, I can't read, unfortunately, dev chat at the same time. Um, David uh, uh, implemented the step definitions and behind features that use the same generation to create all the same instances, users, enrollments, courses, and so forth. There is a link on this page for, for the feature that tests all these um, generators. Urban Ninja. Oh, um, um, also, any developer can just write his own script that generates as many users or courses or modules inside this course as, as they want and use it as they want and, um, later. So this is an example of script that um, I can I can run. Um, I hope I spelled it correct. So it created 10 users and a course, enrolled the users in the course as students, and created one instance of each module that has a generator. 
Well, I really hope that before 2.6 release, there will be generators for all modules, because I'm working on it at the moment. Uh, but at the moment, there are only eight. No, there are actually more. There is uh, all the assignment and feedback as well. So there are 10, but they are hidden. And uh, as you can see, the 10 users with different names, random names, are enrolled in this course. Um, OK, so um, something good and bad about generator. So generator um, can use, um, doesn't guarantee that it checks the capabilities or settings um, um, uh, because we use the core API functions. And sometimes if there is a separate function for checking the capabilities, we just ignore it and don't, don't use any generator. But sometimes the capability checks are inside the um, uh, functions that actually create data. So it's better than you set the user um, that has all the capabilities to perform the actions. Um, events can be triggered or cannot be triggered during the uh, data gen uh, generator work. Um, this is also not guaranteed. Um, also, the bad thing about the generator is that um, there is still a lot of, um, not bad thing, but something that generators can't do. There is still a lot of um, um, PHP code that's not in the libraries, but inside the PHP files that are accessible from the web. Uh, for example, you edit, I don't know, some, something, and file edit.php has half of the code for entering it into database. Um, and it's impossible, well, we try to move it into the libraries, but it's a slow process. Um, so generator doesn't generate everything. Um, other, other tools that can be used for generation uh, of student data, especially student data, are web services and Behat features. Um, I particularly like Behat features. Um, like, for example, I had the I had a test once when I had to test the quiz um, grading form that had at least 100 of students uh, attempted it. The only way I could generate 100 students taking a quiz is to create a Behat feature, which was obviously 400 lines long or something like that, that uh, emulated 100 users log in, click the button, log out. Um, after the head test is finished, I can use the website with the results of the feature, or I can make a backup and use it on another site. Also, there is a um, tool generator make test course script. Um, uh, but uh, um, it generates the course. You cannot really control what's inside this course. So it generates you hundreds of page resources. You need, it's useful if you need to test backup. Uh, but I don't. F I, I haven't found any other purposes for myself yet with this tool. Um, David just mentioned that I'm working on using the API, but I'm working on using the API for generating modules. It's not going to change very much. You still can't generate student data and um, everything that's not in libraries. Um, OK, that's, that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Uh, I think uh, that was a pretty. You did mention everything there. We got um, there's uh, some questions in the chat though. Uh, well, a bit of discussion going on about uh, should it be triggering events when we're generating data. Um, 
We do trigger sometimes, sometimes not. At the moment, model generation doesn't uh, trigger events, but hopefully, um, after a couple of weeks, it will be. <laughs> uh, well, personally, I, I, you know, it should definitely be optional. I, we probably just slow things down, and it usually we're not we, we, we're generating data to do other testing with. I guess if we're testing events, triggering that's another another thing entirely. <laughs> anyway, okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, well, um, uh, let's uh, let's get off Thank to you. bed, uh, and I'll cut off to the uh, next person. So I shuffled it round a bit because it seemed to go on naturally onto David after what you've just talked about, Marina. So uh, over to David. Um, so I'll put you next after that. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? You have to talk quite loud. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, that's actually better. Oh, yes, yes I will raise it a bit more. Uh, now, what about now? Even okay? better. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, as Martin said, following the testing uh, and data generator thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about a new tool that we have been working on about its performance testing. So we needed the big data sets to run that performance test. And uh, when Sam Marshall wrote that course generation tool, from there we added a, a site generation tool to, to create a bunch of courses and users. and. Uh, from them, from there, we created a, a tool to generate a G-meter test plan. So um, this tool, I will share the screen. Can you see it? Yep, that's fine, Dave. Yeah. OK. <coughs> this is the project. It's back to you. Sorry? It's back to you again, your face. Ah, OK, OK. Uh, to my face? Yeah. Well, OK, now, yeah. this is the main, the main, it's OK, you know? <laughs> yes, no? Yep. This it's is the, okay. the main page of the, of the project. And, uh, I guess that everybody's interested on that because we we discuss it with Martin and Tim Han, Deloitte, a lot of people, and uh, there are different proposals of what we want to to test and what kind of performance of comparisons we want to do. We can be interested in in as a developer test a patch that we just wrote to ensure that we are not creating a performance regression, or if we are looking for a performance benefit check that, that there is a real performance benefit. Uh, to compare uh, every weekly release against the latest integration release, uh, try different configurations of, of Moodle settings, how they affect the performance of the site, try different infrastructures, databases and genes, how they affect everything. So we have a lot of scenarios where this kind of test can be useful. So from there, uh, we, we begin to generate the tool. We thought that Gmeter as is a tool spe specialized on that, could be probably a good tool for that. So from Moodle, we are generating that test plan. And uh, having this, we have a lot of information about the Moodle site we are testing. And we split the, all, the, um, all the process in three parts. We begin checking out from uh, from a base commit that it's hard, usually hard-coded. Everything is, is configurable. You can look at the project, change whatever you want. But usually this hard-coded is the last version where the tool had a change in the data generators. So from there we upgrade to a before branch. And then we restore the same first point and we restore, we upgrade to the to the after branch. So we are comparing a before and an after branch. 
we begin uh, generating the site, adding courses, adding users, generating the test plan, and from them we we do bot upgrade. Uh, right now we are working on uh, on adding all that to our CI server because we are using another tool right now and uh, and um, well with this we 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 are for, we know for sure that we restore a database we restore a database and data root so we begin with a clean environment and we are able to to reproduce the same exact scenario so the same data set is a fixed data set and the same users the same the same test plan gmeter can uh, it's not exactly always the same the way gmeter sends the request and the users maybe uh, the first user logs in the second one is logging but in another run will be the first one that is logging while the second step is that the same user goes to a course so it's not always exactly the same but we added a uh, we we saw that with five loops. I don't know if somebody is used to, to use Gmeter, but you have a test plan, a number of threads, that is the number of users, and then you have a number of loops to repeat all the plan. So with five loops and about 30 users, we have reached a consistent results. And uh, to simplify it more than anything else. Mm, we created a script where you just you just have to run it and it's very useful as a developer because you just need to set the database. I will show you the, maybe it's better to show you an example. You just need to set the database um, uh, data like where is the database, um, the typical things that you set in a config file and uh, the branch, which, we, which one is the before branch and the after branch because uh, probably before branch in a this in a developer scenario so you're working your issue usually the um, before branch will be the last weekly and after branch will be well in this case is the example master but in here we can add uh, mdl 457 will be your issue so, so what a normal developer should change in fact is all that the data from from the database. Where is the database? All the other config settings are more or less clear. Then um, the current test plan includes tries to follow what a normal user does in a real site. So he lo a student. Sorry, it's important to mention that he's a student. It logs into the system, sees the front page, goes to a course, checks a couple of resources, then goes to a forum, posts in a forum and logs out. We, we will uh, be increasing the number of steps of the plan, so we will cover more things. So that all this, um, all, all this site has a config file, a uh, config file uh, in it, uh, what is it? Set model, a script to enable all the advanced features and uh, showing in front page as you can see, old course list and enrolled course list. So and this is to detect the more regressions possible as we can. So if we have the normal default site, probably we will not detect as much as we will do setting everything at the highest level. Then we will, this same tool is the one that we will be using in Jenkins to run every day against, to compare the last weekly release with the uh, integration version. Uh, we, I am working right now in this, in this integration in there, in the, in the Jenkins, because we also want to receive notifications directly to integration chat. So we don't know to check manually every day or every week what's the difference between one and the other one. We set a threshold where we can accept that uh, one or two percent is acceptable and from there we will compare the results if it's inside the threshold okay otherwise we will send a notification we can send a notification um, uh, looking at each 
at each bar that we have, like database database reads, database reads. These are the bars we have. So for each one we will compare it and also for each step of the plan. Uh, I don't know why I lost the... mm -hmm. Ah yes, also you may be interested in, uh, in using your own uh, SQL backup. For example, if you are a university and you want to to test what will be the performance using uh, the new version of Moodle or if it's worth to operate or not, it's always work. I can show you now. Right? Just in case you have any doubts, you can check using this tool, your restored database. There are instructions in, uh, in the readme to explain all the, the possible scenarios that you may be interested in trying. So Gmeter and uh, the web server are in the same computer and probably will be a developer computer because most of the time if you want to do serious testing, uh, performance testing, you will have a virtual machine or a server dedicated to the performance testing. You don't have any interference with external uh, application services or whatever. And in here, uh, weapon the Jimmy servers at different computers, then is the steps to, to run the test are uh, more complex because you have to send a couple of files to the to the other node so it knows the data from the sites you are testing. Otherwise for Jimmy there is all blind. He needs a test plan with the users to log in with the with the data to log in, in the site. And this one was using your own SQL dump. So this is more complex, but anyway, there are, it's a more manual process, this. But we can do it. And also we can do it if it's before to five, because I forgot to mention, this will be in to five and to six. We have 42 to two five, because we, can, we will use them, in fact, to, to check the, the differences between uh, to five and the new to six. We'll have those resources. And I don't know if I'm missing something. It's compatible with OS X thanks to Alloy. And uh, we expect that we can share the results to check what kind of combinations of settings or whatever can act, can uh, affect more the performance of the site. We can do it now, just sharing the runs that are PSP files, but so we can look into a more evolved solution, looking for uh, that tool to import the files, export, all sorts of things. That depends on the time we have and everything. And I think that it's all. I'm going to check the chat because probably I will miss the question, I don't know. Oh, you are hitting my housemate. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry about that. Well, yes, the more people that try it, uh, the more people we will have. At the moment, Eloy tried in. Uh, in, uh, in uh, OS X, I think working in Ubuntu and uh, using our virtual machines for, with Jenkins, splitting the, um, the Zimeter server and the web server, and no problem at the moment, but I'm sure that if uh, you test it in Solaris, you will have problems because Solaris, when well, someone works with Solaris, no, 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 it's, it's more easy than be hard because the components are more simple. Yeah, well, Jimmy is based on, on Java, but it's just in the command. It's not like in Selenium that you never know, well, you never know. You have problems to really understand where finishes the scope of one component, the other one. In here, all the, all the steps are 
in my opinion, I don't know, probably we will get feedback, feedback about it, that are clearly defined and separated. So, oh, Eric, good to hear that we have this issue. I think that you are the first person that says that. Uh, about about the, those tests, they, if you run as a developer and you just want to avoid regressions and look how good you are, with running compare.sh, you have enough. But if you are an administration and an administrator and you want to do more evolved complex things, you have. Following what some Marshall wrote, we have the size of the site. The, the one in the um, compare as it is an S, which is 30 users and five loops. And here we go to 100 users. And if I remember correctly, I've never run them, but this is 1,000. So here 1,000, maybe 5,000, and 10,000 users. And the number of loops and everything is growing. So it can be a really, really big data set. There is any question or I'm missing something? Uh, David, do you have uh, um, ah, those, ah. The, the output? Yes. yes, this is when you finish, well, you, you will have the output of of what regressions have you found and what good improvements do you have and also with this is a simple tool that just reads that generated PHP files with a big big array of all the data you can filter everything compare crazy things and crazy things I mean because you can try to to compare a small run with a, a big run I don't know if this one would work well, this this all is all default uh, default names because I'm using the compare script. Oh, now it finished. When it finishes, it opens a, a browser window. Imagine this is the future. With with the small test, it shows all the info about it. Right now, it's comparing. Model to six. Model to six. Yeah, it's supposed to compare that. Where is the compressed? And here. To six beta with the last weekly release of model to five. This is using Google Google charts to show the info. So we have the, the totals and the raw data of each thread. And uh, from here this is all part of those tool of this tool we, uh, we can add more charts uh, change them group by uh, this is, is currently grouped by step I don't know oh, it's not showing it. and uh, we can add whatever whatever we need uh, no in this we can compare everything we can see how it's evolving depending on the step also in here we have group by to have it all together, a general overview of what is going bad or going good. And uh, also, there is a link to, to the tool that some Helmerit wrote that is also, it's more numeric. So, in here, you can see all numeric data. The other one is more, you see how cool the charts are, and don't worry about real numbers. Going to read David, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, your screen's cast is working because we're just stuck looking at the top of the new tool. Oh, it's working now. Yeah. Can you scroll down yeah. and show the graphs? There we go. Can you see it now? Yeah. You still see it? I'm going down yeah, to other Yeah, can see it now. It's just scrolling. So we're just looking at two runs here, but... Um, Yes, uh, we can compare uh, more of them, but in can this you, case, can I you, just run. Do you have, uh, I, maybe you don't have them on that local laptop, but do you have any more to show, or that's it? Those. 
No, I, right now I have this, but we can select three of them. And uh -huh. the, but what happens is that probably the results of two of them will be the same. But anyway, in here you can you can prepare your patch and say the first alternative with with changing just a bit. The second alternative changing uh, array k exists for mm. each set. Well, probably other perf profiling tools will be better for that. But anyway, you can you can see with this. So th this starts getting you, really useful to look for an, a, one anomalous. If there's something that's anomalous among a whole lot of runs, it really starts standing out. I, I don't know if you still can see it. If you if you work in your patch, you can uh, you can change configuration of the site, test again, and see how it evolves. And uh, you will know what you're doing with your patch, but probably this will help you. Cool. Lot of solar spans, I see. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, this uh, yeah, it would be nice to see this tool developing as people uh, use it and then find what else they want to add to it or extend it. It'd be nice yeah. to. Uh... Cool. Yeah. Thanks, David. I think uh, unless anyone else has got any questions. Yeah. Yes, probably nobody understood my English, but I will be happy to reply writing in English. Probably better. I think the, the code will speak for itself. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll move on. So, next one, uh, Aparup, uh, talking about uh, the plugins uh, database and all news related. Oh, hello. Okay, let me try to share. Why is it not popping up? Uh, hang on, this just popped up previously. I somehow can't share my screen. Oh, um, is it what's happening? Uh, nothing's popping up when I click the screen share. Uh, maybe you did it before and it's in the background somewhere. I've had that before. Oh. Just try and move all your windows away or. If you were sharing your screen, it wouldn't show your face to the Hangout. No, but the, the sharing yeah. dialog can sometimes be in the background and you can click away from it and then you can't find it again. No, that makes sense. You might need to go out of the call and come back in. Maybe we can go to the next item. Ah, uh, wait, I found it. Yep. Yeah, it was in somewhere else. Uh, is that screen being shown? Yep. That's looking good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was going to start off with uh, recent changes to the directory. Um, well, first off, uh, categories, two new categories have been added. Uh, you have the uh, calendars. Uh, this is... Uh, from Moodle 2.6 where we have um, uh, what do you call them? Calendar types. Uh, I think there's one in there right now. Uh, it's the Japanese calendar type. Uh, I'm not logged in, am I? Oh, that's right. It's for 2.6. So once that uh, comes through, that will show up there. Um, the other thing was uh, at all. Uh, in um, uh, under editors uh, in 2.6 um, it's not going to include at all so 
we're going to have a the Atto editor, uh, once that goes through a testing and approval, then that will show up by itself. And it will also support uh, plugins that um, I'm sure Damon will be happy to see. Um, Uh, the other thing I think might be useful to everyone uh, is uh, that there's now these two new RSS feeds that sort of split up the um, the, the recently released plugins RSS below. Uh, it splits it up into uh, because that 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 old RSS feed below includes uh, version changes to all sub uh, plugin entries uh, including new ones and you know updates uh, so now we have the um, new plugins feed so this includes only uh, first time uh, newly approved plugins into the directory versus the updated plugins feed where these are only version updates to plugins so the, the stark difference there and you might want to monitor them separately or both in line. The the old the old RSS feed will still remain there in case you know you, you also love this one. Um, <laughs> yeah, finally. Um, yeah, I'm also still pondering whether which should go in the front page, but uh, this will this will work in line with the new theme that we're working on as well. Um, Let's see. So yeah, that's the that's the RSS feed. Uh, notifications. I'm sure um, most of the developers here would have noticed by now that uh, well, I didn't get to cover this before, but uh, we've we've got notifications. So if you go in, let me log in here. If you go into a plugin, you can. Developers will get notified of um, comments, uh, approvals, and uh, say say I go to simple clock. That should be simple. Ah, hello, Michael. So so these are the comments section. Previously, this was a mess. Um, now you have the subscribe to comments. Uh, this allows uh, anyone to follow or stop following comments, and you get notified of comments in this section. The developers always get notified. Uh, these can, of course, be managed in your in your uh, messaging settings as well. Sorry, getting distracted with dev chat. Uh, can you guys hear me still? Yeah, yeah, can hear you fine. Yeah, okay, cool. It was just very quiet. <laughs> um, notifications, yep. Yeah. So uh, further to notifications, I'm thinking of adding more notifications, like, um, say, new versions to a specific plugin, um, notif notifications to, um, the like, the RSS feeds. I'm going to build notifications from that. So you get notified when there's updates or new plugins, or new plugins to a specific plugin you want to be notified about. Um, thanks for all the tweets. Um, okay, so okay, yeah. Recently, I just put this in as well. So you might notice that this has popped up here. Uh, translations. I've uh, been seeing a few comments uh, in in I'll get to that. Um, yeah, a few comments where the, the the translations are given in the comment. So I I thought I'd like to, you know, sort of expose the fact that uh, Amos and plugins directory are working together. Uh, the plugins that you um, register here. Uh, the lang file gets parsed and sent, or sent and parsed at Amos, and you always have a 
translation pack there for your plugin. So uh, if you'd like to encourage more translations of your plugin or find that they're used elsewhere but you know limited in language, point them to that link. That link will point them to the latest uh, translation version that is hosted at Amos. <clears throat> I'm sure David will, uh, David Mudrak will can elaborate on that some more. Uh, so, uh, I did also work on a little search of my own. Uh, a few guys at HQ have been, uh, um, you know, always asking about if if this is used in plugins or if we change this, will it, you know, break com backward compatibility? And usually, you go, of course it will, but you know, people want to be assured. So I've got this um, little search that is very limited at the moment too, because it's a GitHub uh, uh, preview API for GitHub searching. Um, so what you see, you see what I just did here was uh, I searched code. So this just picked up, at the moment it only supports GitHub uh, repositories. It searched all the GitHub repositories for those code. Uh, matches and if I open this up here, uh, you can see that uh, the filters and the links all show up for this plugin. Um, the same for say Code Checker. So you can go into Code Checker and uh, you know that the, the to search queries there, you can add on to it or play with it furthermore. Uh, once the GitHub API is up, uh, out of preview stage, I might, you know, look at opening this up. Uh, uh, of course, this is at the moment limited to GitHub, but uh, definitely it'll be better if we can search through everything. So, aside from trying to support different repositories, we're gonna, I'm gonna look at uh, searching the actual zip files that we have hosting ourselves. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so along with, uh, is the lag all right, or should I slow down? It uh, seems to be up to two minutes for some people. Wow. It's okay, you don't have to wait for two minutes, just keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, where was I? Translation. Ah, okay, so recently we've got a um, plugin that was taken out of core. Uh, I have that open. I will just search for it. If I can type. Okay, so my mobile was uh, used to be uh, I think it got into core in 2.2. .2. Uh, uh, it's been taken out now. Obviously, the boost bootstrap and its framework is going to be much more useful. But but this is still back in the directory because you know uh, obviously it has worked for some people and there are people who like it and who might depend on it. Uh, that the problem is we don't know who's going to maintain it. So we have a nobody user, uh, username is maintainer wanted, I think. Um, this is uh, after I had this set up a while ago, but now I'm getting to use it because of my mobile. Uh, Jerome kindly put up the zip and things worked out. So I think, uh, yeah, it's approved now. Um, the thing about nobody maintainer wanted is you can, if you're having problems with a plugin or trying, you know, you want to share a plugin, but you don't really have time to maintain it, well, uh, feel free to add the nobody maintainer wanted user. Uh, it's 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 like kind of like a way to 
mm, say ask for more maintainers. I suppose we could rename the, the wording there to more maintainers wanted. Um, this is the first time I'm using this, so just putting this out there. Um, yeah, um, also looking to using this for. Uh, so we've got unapproved plugins, and and these these end up sometimes dead in the water. But um, uh, it'll be it'll be nice to you know not get rid of code, but have it re-energized or what's the word resurrected. Yeah. So um, yeah, so again, I'm looking at using this user so that we can advertise this this page and uh, trying to like get things resurrected there. Um, okay, uh, that's pretty much covering all the new things. Future stuff. Ah, wait. Before I get into future work. Uh, There's lots of stuff. Mm, yep. So, as you all know, we've got beta. Uh, I've added the uh, Moodle 2.6 as a version now to the plugins database directory. So confusing. Um, the thing here, though, is that uh, it requires the beta release. Uh, this will be updated after release day. So just to point out that at this point, we, we can accept uh, like we did the last round, but I'm not sure if there were many registrations at that point. But you can uh, send in your uh, plugins to require Moodle 2.6, this beta version. Uh, the thing, though, is that on release day, that, that version number will be uh, pumped up to release version number. Uh, yep. Uh, yep, that's it about that uh, version number. Uh, so on future work, uh, oh, I have the little hat here. I wanted to talk about, oh, there's lots of stuff. Do we have time? <laughs> um, the Moodle hat is basically, uh, well, Martin created this. Uh, he said, you know, he said, this is an award given by me for my favorite plugins. Well, it turns out my favorite plugins have evolved into plugins that cater towards, uh, you know, making it easier, fun um, to learn. Uh, I recently approved, uh, got, put this up, uh, free hand drawing. So that, that's a question type that matches uh, a drawing with the teacher's drawing, and uh, it um, it tries to gauge how much the drawing overlaps, I think, uh, and and gives you a grade based on that. So the green parts are overlapping the blue, between the blue and the red. Uh, these are interesting concepts. I mean, this can this can be useful, or fun for kids. Uh, so this is side of sort of like things I've, I've been putting up the award for. Uh, of course, uh, the award. I think people like the award, so maybe we could come up with more awards um, to specify different things, or different areas, uh, which leads me to future stuff I'm trying to work on. Uh, reviews. Now, where's the screen? Ah, are you seeing the review screen? Uh, no. No. May not, no? Uh, still looking at the my mobile thing. All right. Yep, yep. Oh. Oh, gosh. It hasn't uh, moved in quite a while. I think you're on the wrong window. Yep. Okay, let me change that. Yeah, about the the, the awards thing. I, I guess the idea there was that there's some sort of editor's award, but um, yeah, well, we we also need ratings and reviews from various other people as well to to surface things in other ways. 
Okay, so sorry, so I, I completely missed this. I was going through the, is, is that screen shared now? So is the drawing shared now? Like, this is the plugin I was talking, talking about, a freehand drawing where... Uh, we're still, over no, we're still looking at the My Mobile. Um, you're on a window that, it's a different window maybe, it has, because uh, I can see your mouse moving occasionally. You've got something like 10 stats tabs. I start screen share and it doesn't load it. Okay, it's. I'll just drag my tab onto this shared window. Yeah, because it's actually sharing the, the window, not the screen. Yeah. <clears throat> Still nothing. Uh, just. Sorry. Copying URLs are easier on a small screen. My mobile, yep. There you go. Yep. So I came to this plugin on the plugin awards page, uh, which is, I'll just pop that up later on. So just mention, sorry. We're running a bit short on time, so don't. Uh, yeah, just. Uh, okay. Uh, well. Keep moving. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, all right. So future work I had in mind was. Okay, just copying stuff over from my other window too. That is so annoying. Was the plugin. Uh, reviews um, like to kick that up, up a notch and uh, open that up. As you can see, um, the UI it, at the moment the reviews are linked and uh, tied down to per version. Uh, that's not per version, but per Moodle, you know, version supported. Um, uh, that was a bit too restrictive, I think, and. And especially when reviews still applied to the later versions, it was not very fair. So I'm going to work on that a bit and try to open that up, as well as uh, try to push for more people reviewing it. Um, Actually, there's a few people here from um, Moodle Partners, and Moodle Partners do a lot of reviewing already. Um, so we're going to uh, remind them again to uh, uh, I guess submit their reviews of things here so they can share them more widely. Uh, and anyone yes. else who might find reviews, if, if you're with a Moodle site out there and you've reviewed a plugin, then um, you should be able to get it here. So um, I guess uh, up, up, you need to kind of make it uh, clearer how to get them to you or to this page. Yep, yep. Uh, well, um, Helen has been helping out on that front, uh, when people were interested, but there is always a, there is always a ah, there's a plugins at Moodle dot org, uh, which is also an alias to currently me, uh, but uh, I'm sure everyone, you know, if you're going to review a plugin, you're pretty much involved in the community and can contact me or Helen, or anyone actually, because you know. So close. Well, so the problem, the problem at the moment is only um, approved people can do reviews, right? Even general reviews currently. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll look. Uh, so the plan is to to open that up. Uh, I'll have uh, I'll have at the moment it's managed in cohorts, so I'll have a more generic review uh, opened up to a wider cohort of uh, you know regulars. Um, so at, after that, almost almost anyone who's actively involved, uh, you know, posting regularly, or, or up, will will be able to put up a review. Um, and you know, further to that, we'd have uh, other criteria like security-related reviews, which of course would narrow the number of reviewers who who, who are, um, could do that. 
but uh, the generic one will always be uh, easily available for reviewing to uh, regulars or well, what, to the general general community. Um, yeah, so that's one front uh, reviews. Uh, my screen is being shared, right? Yep. Uh, the other front is uh, notifications. Uh, sorry, I just uh, scoot along. Notifications, subscriptions. I'm trying to add new, you know, based on the RSS feeds, and and I think I might have mentioned it already. Uh, the other thing is uh, I have all these stats open. Um, I hope the tabs are showing. Yep. Uh, I noticed that these stats are kind of skewed in the sense that you have all the plugins in a category, say say activities, but they don't necessarily reflect a popular plugin across, you know, Moodle versions especially. So uh, these are one of the filters I'm trying to build into the st uh, statistics so that. You can get a better cross-sectional view of what's going on. Uh, also, other things like um, movers, and you can't really tell from the last two months uh, what's gone up and what's gone down. So I might highlight that better. Uh, and the other thing, lastly, is tags. So we've got categories here. We've got these fixed categories, mainly based oops, on uh, Moodle structure, um, but uh, you know things have been brought up where like we have all these video related plugins, or we have conferencing plugins, or we have you know various ways of categorizing uh, users. Uh, yeah, so I will be uh, working on building tags into the plugin directory. That's about it. Uh, Okay, thanks. Uh, yep. I should move on uh, because uh, time is moving on. Yep. Uh, we're only halfway through the list, actually, and we're well over <laughs> half on time. So thanks for that. Um, anyone has any questions or suggestions, obviously talk straight to Abrup uh, or on the tracker. Um, there is a project for it, right? There's a component under Moodle sites? Yes, yes, moodle.org slash plugins component. Right. Feel free to make uh, so creation. Uh, over to Peter to talk about some session changes and then uh, plugin management uh, and sub plugins, uh, all important stuff. So um, listen up, Peter. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll continue first talking about sub plugins and general plugin management, and after that, after, uh, after that, about sessions. Um, in the backend team, we looked at issues with plugin uninstallation, performance uh, on administration tree, and uh, all these areas. And the end result is that uh, the plugin management was uh, significantly cleaned up. It should be faster now. There are some new features. And uh, finally, uh, all plugin types and sub plugins should support clean uninstallation. All the plugins should be listed in the plugins overview. All the information or all the uh, stuff on plugin management pages should be more consistent. All the tables should be a bit more similar. So if you are managing lots of plugins or if you are uh, uh, implementing your own plugins, so you should see some changes in this area. Uh, it's all, everything is using the new automatic class loader, so all the plugin info classes are now stored in a new namespace. Uh, and uh, if you, well, all plugin info classes should be working. Uh, there might be some small issues, so I would strongly recommend to test your sub plugins and plugins uh, in the beta version or some release candidate. 
and uh, it would be great if everybody could update their plugin info in sub plugins. You can see a lot of examples in the standard code base. Uh, I went through all the sub plugin types and all the plugin types, and everything should be updated. And hopefully, most of the bugs we had there for years should be now fixed. So you can copy it from Tiny MCE Workshop or any other plugin type that is using sub plugins. So uh, I guess uh, there's one remaining issue I might be working, and it the installation of plugin dependencies. There's some heated discussion at the moment in the tracker and in using Moodle. So I, I guess we should uh, resolve it somehow. So, yeah. I guess if you have questions, we could discuss it through the using Moodle or tracker. And there's it's no significant changes. It's just a cleanup, but in all areas that are related to plugin management, sub plugins, installation, uninstallation, and all these tasks. Should I wait for any questions? Uh, I've also updated the documentation for sub plugins. I'm pasting it to the developer chat. And we have activity modules for ages. Since 2.4, we have HTML editors can have sub plugins. And now, starting in 2.6, you can have sub plugins in local plugins and admin tools. The only potential problem there is that the names must be unique throughout all the plugins. So take good care to find a good sub plugin name which is short and is not going to collide with anything else in case of activities i would recommend some activity uh, plugin name uh, for example workshop is using workshop prefix for everything uh, but uh, for some activities or plugins you might have some problems if the names is already long Any other question? Oh, and the performance. In 2.5, it was quite expensive to use the plugin manager uh, abstraction because it was curing database, it was curing uh, the file system, looking for the versions. And now everything should be cached. Well, most of the things should be cached in, uh, in MUC. So if you need to find out a list of active plugins you uh, of given type you may use the plugin manager now it should be relatively cheap so that's also a major improvement yeah it was like i guess 20 percent of of memory per page and some database queries. So, uh, of course, only when you are logged in as administrator, but it was quite significant. Yeah. When creating new plugin, always try to find as short name as possible because <laughs> it will save you a lot of typing, and at the same time you will not have problems with database tables. So something like Eto, Book, or <laughs> whatever else, things like Workshop, ah, they are too long. Oh. Oracle databases. Good question. Uh, I went a bit ahead and tried to summarize the current state of Oracle support on the release nodes. So far, nobody was screaming yet 
So let's see where it goes. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions about subplugins, plugin management, or whatever? We still have a few weeks, so I hope I will spend some time fixing issues in this area. There are still some issues submitted for integration, such as file permissions, better compatibility with custom zip packages when installing add ons, and so on and so on. Okay, so sessions. Well, there was a long, long discussion about inclusion of memcache. And also, I had to explain multiple times what is the difference between legacy and, well, database driver for sessions we had since Moodle 2.0. And one day, I just told to myself enough well, it's not going anywhere. And I tried to implement a fresh new sessions abstraction. So I took all the bits from the database design, from the main memcache driver, and I tried to find a subset of features that we really need and the performance that was present in the native memcache driver. And we ended up with a new session infrastructure, which uh, also includes three new, completely new session drivers. One is for file storage, second is for database, and the third one is for memcached PHP driver for memcached server. Uh, what's the difference compared to the old drivers? And the performance is dependent on the underlying PHP session driver. So instead of creating a completely new session driver like we had in 2.0, this, uh, this new design in, is based around native PHP session drivers. And it's just maintaining the list of active sessions and their properties in the original session stable. So if we compare the performance of the database driver, it's a bit lower. Uh, the performance of the file is also a bit, bit lower. And the uh, memcached uh, session driver is also a bit lower. But we are talking only, ab only about one query reading per page and 0. Point something write to database on page. So the performance decrease was not significant. But on the other hand, now all the three database, uh, all the three sessions drivers are behaving exactly the same. They have similar locking. They update the same database table. When you, for example, delete the user, the the session is terminated in all three of them. So we don't have the distinction between the legacy and the new session drivers anymore. We just have three session drivers, which are pretty much equivalent. Uh, the memcached is strongly recommended for everybody with large installations because it has the best performance and it should be relatively reliable because it was tested live by multiple partners already. So there shouldn't be any huge technical problems, but you need to configure your service properly. Then the database one, it should be as reliable as before. And the file-based session driver, which is now the default one, should be working mostly for everybody with decent file system. That means it needs to support file blocking. So, so far, we have just one report where sessions didn't work during installation, but I'm not sure it's a 
where is the problem coming from? I suspect that's some file system problem or PHP problem uh, on that one specific server. Nobody else uh, was reporting any problems with the session driver yet. So it would be great if all the large installation tried it with some uh, JMeter or whatever and try to measure the performance, uh, especially when using Memcached server. Uh, do we have any questions? Nope. Yes. Uh, oh, I could also talk a bit about clusters in the meantime and about MUC improvements and performance improvements in general. And in the meantime, hopefully, people might ask questions. So we have a, the new local cache there directory, which can be used on shared uh, on clusters. And it's used primarily for the files which are used from themes. So it's theme caching. And also for local MUC stores. Uh, the changes were in themes, JavaScript, strings, uh, plugin informa plugin manager and one or two more uh, yes it's the course related caching and some more areas so if you compare 2.6 or and 2.5 it should be easier to get better performance on shared clusters uh, we have much faster uh, automatic loading of classes and also all the stuff that's included for administrators should be much faster. That actually improved the login times too for normal users. Oh. <laughs> I hope it will be visible on the release notes. It's usually some features <laughs> are hiding improvements in other areas but Database table problems? I have no idea what the question is about. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the stuff that can be cached locally, uh, the only place which has up to date documentation is the definition of caches itself. I was trying to add comments there when I was working on those improvements. I always stated whether it has to be shared or if it can be local. Uh, in case of the database, well, it's a problem because it should be shared cache. Okay, well, uh, I, I'm not sure there's going to be many um, uh, any questions about it. It all sounds good, so um, thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, good stuff, uh, and I'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, Jason uh, is stepping in to talk a bit about some HTML guidelines and some stuff that was triggered by a question from Tim uh, in the... Uh, in the notes. So, um, Jason, are you still there? Or are you? Um, your friend yes, I'm still here. He's good. He's frozen. Yeah. Okay. Um, this this whole project was started off by uh, the front end team, primarily Barbara and Rosie, in response to uh, a discussion that occurred at the Hackfest with Amy, myself, Barbara and I think Rosie was also part of the discussion as well. But um, it, it came out of the, the point that we wanted to avoid uh, overcomplicating the DOM, in particular headings. Um, 
where we had divs acting as H2s, we had uh, spans acting as H3s, we had all sorts of crazy stuff happening, um, and they were using uh, CSS classes or class attributes and then targeting it with CSS um, in order to make it look like the the, ta uh, the element that it was um, impersonating. So we've uh, based on the discussion from the Hackfest, we've written up this uh, HTML guideline, the purpose of which is to provide the groundwork for clearer and more consistent uh, document object model throughout Moodle. Um, you can, you can see there in the, the purpose there um, what we're all trying to achieve. Um, yeah, we, we've started work on this. Um, I, I've posted links to the, the meta of the issues that include the, the, the issues that we've done to, to get this started and get this finished so far. Um, there's also a lot of discussion going on on the forums about it. Um, whether or not we're doing it the right way, whether our, our goals are, are justified and all that sort of thing. Um, but w it, it, the end objective is to improve Moodle both for sighted and non-sighted users by improving the DOM in a semantic way and should have the side effect of allowing themes in Moodle to be more consistently handled, uh, to more consistently handle headers. Um, this will then go on to be, uh, uh, this will be extended to handle other elements, um, paragraphs, whatever. That was the uh, the original goal. Whether that will continue um, is something that Barbara and Rosie will need to decide. Um, they were the ones that did all the specking on this, and basically, yeah, wrote up the 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 objectives for this issue. Um, yeah, that, that's about all there is to say about it. Um, does anyone have any questions? I guess Tim Hunt would have been the one to have the most questions. Um, but he's, yeah, unfortunately unavailable to be here. It doesn't look like there's any questions, so... Oh, sorry, I was talking to you without my microphone. I was just saying that, uh, yeah, Tim's uh, obviously uh, spoken elsewhere, but um, the uh, you haven't showed it I, that I can see, but because uh, I just saw the one screen there, but uh, the headings look pretty good, in my opinion, on 2.6, uh, on the places where they weren't before, generally. Um, so I think it's a I think it's a win, especially on mobile. So um, so maybe. Um, before we move on, maybe Jason could just mention what what is expected of developers uh, in relation to particularly activity modules. Hmm. Okay. Basically, what we're trying to do is get to uh, get all of the the headings into a semantic um, semantic leveling. Um, as you, I, I don't know if it's going to show up on on Hangout, but can you guys see that that pop up that's appeared on my page in Chrome there? No, no, we can only see the... Uh, no, it's, it's uh, Windows-specific. It, That's really it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, because I've, I've got this a plugin called HTML Semantic Headings, and what it does is it gives you a, a an outline of the entire page based on the the headings in the page. So, for, for example, this docs page, it starts off with HTML guidelines as the top level, then it goes to the next one which is purpose, then header, then underneath that it's a new level of block, then back to the previous and keeps on going through like that. And that's what we're trying to achieve with um, with this heading thing. So yeah, we're, we're trying to make it semantic so it steps down, there are no skip levels. Um, and as you can see here in the, the, 
the docs, there's an example of, with the book what we really want to achieve, um, and we're trying, we're trying, but we haven't quite mastered yet all of the different areas, um, all the different modules. For example, quiz, SCORM, LTI, um, where this should also be applied. But um, if if other uh, module authors and developers could have a look at this page, um, discuss what they think is wrong with it or right with it on the forum, give us some feedback and try and implement it within your, your modules so that we can, we can get a consistent looking Moodle for all themes so that themers don't have to worry about this page looking different to that page because this heading is missing or they need to take target a H3 and make it look like a H2 because there is no H2 on the page and that sort of thing. Oh, as for the, the, the duplication of headings, um, yeah, that, that's something that we, we really need to, to get sorted. Um, there has been a few duplicate headings, but I, from what I saw of Tim's um, comments, his biggest complaint was not so much the duplication of headings, but the duplication of the content of the headings on the page. So we would have a, um, uh, what you call it, a, a, the, the breadcrumbs would, would mention something, and then we'd put a H2 on the page that said the exact same thing. Now, that's not a problem. Because if that's if if you don't want to show the H2, you can access hide it right off the page. So it's there for the screen reader, but it doesn't show up for, visually for the the regular user to to see things. Um, yeah, so th that is one solution to it. That's the idea, David. Um, we, we do hope to have the themes controlling over it because we're hoping to put everything, we're trying to put everything through renderers so that if the theme wants to override the renderer, they can. Um, and we are trying to put sensible, non-vague, non-plain, boring um, class names when needed on elements so that if, if they need to be targeted, they can. Um, David Scottson has raised a very good point that, that we need a way of um, discerning between uh, user-entered headers and theme-rendered he headers so that uh, they can be rendered differently within the page. So if a user inputs a H1 in its content, in, in a page content, we can make it look like something other than a H1 or we can wrap it and make it yeah make it look different. While that is not great for semantics, it is good for theming. Okay, this um, is probably very good. We probably should keep moving now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm done. Um, if anybody, if nobody has any more questions, I'm happy to move on. Thanks, Jason. Um, Actually, while we're talking a bit about accessibility there, um, I should mention um, that in case people weren't aware, we have a new policy um, about policies. There is a component in the tracker that um, has uh, major policies that get discussed and decided, and so they're then recorded. Um, and I'll just post the link here. Uh, it's probably not the best link, but there you can see recent policies that were closed or decided. And one of them, which is the relevant one um, that I wanted to just mention, is that we've decided that from now on, new features can land in Moodle without having a non-JavaScript fallback, which is a change from what we had before. We always said that if JavaScript is off, all features should fall back to something that still works. Um, the policy is now we will allow things to have, um, uh, to, to not have a non-JavaScript fallback. However, they do have to um, meet WCAG um, guidelines, AA. So uh, 
uh, the exact link for that I just lost in one second. Um, but so from now on, um, basically your your work has to be super accessible um, if you're going to be um, relying on JavaScript. And that is Moodle four one uh, MDL four one five three five. I'm not sharing the screen, am I? There we go. Um, it's that one. So read it, read that, and if you know we haven't seen this before, maybe you want to check out the other issues and the policy uh, thing and get involved. We try and um, HQ on our meetings, weekly meetings. We try and look at some every week uh, to get through them. So we've got quite a few other ones decided. So moving on. Uh, uh, the next thing here on the list was Sam uh, to talk about the backup and restore of large courses now being much more reliable, which is a cool little thing that actually I only discovered today because it all hit while I was away recently. So over to you, Sam. Um, are you here? He's not here. How are you going to get in, Sam? Uh, Well, uh, if Sam's not going to get in quickly, then I'm going to jump straight to Sam. Who's next? That's not going to uh, work. Are you able to, able to post the link to him? Like you yeah, did to me earlier? I just did in the dev chat there. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. No, no. Ah, oh, uh, okay. Sam actually did message me before and I missed it. He said uh, he's having trouble getting onto the Hangout and isn't going to bother. So, uh, okay. So, well, the two things that he was going to talk about um, was uh, the backup and restore of large courses is about um, it now supports uh, tar and gzip instead of zip um, if you wanted to, which is a pretty cool thing. Uh, and the restore is uh, backward compatible and will handle both types of formats. So it should be transparent to users. They just shouldn't know. But the reason, the nice thing about that is you get four. You can have over four gig files. So for very large backups, that's good. Um, the last bit, I have no a bit, no idea. <laughs> can I make it so activities can own sections? Well, go and look at the bug and tell him if you think he should. I don't know what that means. I'm not going to read it now on video. So um, is there anything else that anybody wants to cover? Um, we can. We've got nothing else on the agenda, so um, I'll just wait for a minute or so in case any, anybody comes up with anything on the dev chat. Looks like we're winding down going off topic, so um, I think I'll end it here. And um, obviously, we have the dev chat um, all the time, 24 hours, so um, we'll be, you can always talk, to, talk in there, keep in touch. We'd like to see you in there, even though it's, uh, obviously, we're all on different time zones, but that's how it is. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to everyone who has helped all of you uh, with Moodle, as usual. Um, it's uh, vastly appreciated by everyone who uses it. And uh, thank you very much for coming online for the meeting. And uh, we'll see you next time. So, ciao. See you all. Thanks, everyone. See you later.